words of Sri Aurobindo. The possibility and purpose of avatarhood. In the Vedantic view of things, all these apparently formidable objections are null and void from the beginning. The idea of the avatar is not indeed indispensable to its scheme, but comes in naturally into it as a perfectly rational and logical conception. For all here is God, is the spirit or self-existence, is Brahman, ekam evadityam, there is nothing else, nothing other and different from it, and there can be nothing else, can be nothing other and different from it. Nature is and can be nothing else than a power of the divine consciousness. All beings are and can be nothing else than inner and outer, subjective and objective soul forms and bodily forms of the divine being, which exist in or result from the power of its consciousness. Far from the infinite being unable to take on finiteness, the whole universe is nothing else but that. We can see, look as we may, nothing else at all in the whole wide world we inhabit. Far from this spirit being incapable of form or disdaining to connect itself with form of matter or mind or to assume a limited nature or a body, all here is nothing but that. The world exists only by that connection, that assumption. Far from the world being a mechanism of law with no soul or spirit intervening in the movement of its forces or the action of its minds and bodies, only some original indifferent spirit passively existing somewhere outside or above it, the whole world and every particle of it is, on the contrary, nothing but the divine force in action. And that divine force determines and governs its every movement, inhabits its every form, possesses here every soul and mind. All is in God and in Him moves and has its being. In all He is, acts and displays His being. Every creature is the disguised Narayana. Far from the unborn being unable to assume birth, all beings are even in their individuality unborn spirits, eternal, without beginning or end. And in their essential existence and their universality, all are the one unborn spirit of whom birth and death are only a phenomenon of the assumption and change of forms. The assumption of imperfection by the perfect is the whole mystic phenomenon of the universe. But the inf imperfection appears in the form and action of the mind or body assumed, subsists in the phenomenon, in that which assumes it, there is no imperfection, even as in the sun which illumines all, there is no defect of light or of vision, but only in the capacities of the individual organ of vision. Nor does God rule the world from some remote heaven, but by his intimate omnipresence. Each finite working of force is an act of infinite force and not of a limited, separate, self-existent energy laboring in its own underived strength. 
in every finite working of will and knowledge, we can discover, supporting it, an act of the infinite, all will and all knowledge. God's rule is not an absentee, foreign, and external government. He governs all because he exceeds all, but also because he dwells within all movements and is their absolute soul and spirit. Therefore, none of the objections opposed by our reason to the possibility of the avatarhood can stand in their principle. For the principle is a vain division made by the intellectual reason, which the whole phenomenon and the whole reality of the world are busy every moment contradicting and disproving. The Divine Birth The work for which the avatar descends has, like its birth, a double sense and a double form. It has an outward side of the divine force acting upon the external world in order to maintain there and to reshape the divine law by which the Godward effort of humanity is kept from decisive retrogression and instead decisively carried forward in spite of the rule of action and reaction, the rhythm of advance and relapse by which nature proceeds. It was an inward side of the divine force of the Godward consciousness acting upon the soul of the individual and the soul of the race so that it may receive new forms of revelation of the divine in man and may be sustained, renewed, enriched in its power of upward self-unfolding. The avatar does not descend merely for a great outward action, as the pragmatic sense in humanity is too often tempted to suppose. Action and event have no value in themselves, but only take their value from the force which they represent and the idea which they symbolize and which the force is there to serve. The crisis in which the avatar appears, though apparent to the outward eye only as a crisis of events and great material changes, is always in its source and real meaning a crisis in the consciousness of humanity when it has to undergo some grand modification and effect some new development. For this action of change, a divine force is needed, but the force varies always according to the power of consciousness which it embodies. Hence the necessity of a divine consciousness manifesting in the mind and soul of humanity. Where indeed the change is mainly intellectual and practical, the intervention of the avatar is not needed. There is a great uplifting of consciousness, a great manifestation of power in which men are for the time being exalted above their normal selves, and this surge of consciousness and power finds its wave crests in certain exceptional individuals, bibhutis, whose action leading the general action is sufficient for the change intended. But when the crisis has a spiritual seed or intention, then a complete or partial manifestation of the God-consciousness in a human mind and soul comes as its originator or leader. That is the avatar.